Divine Truth Assistance Group. These group assistance sessions are about putting principles of divine truth into action. This discussion is part of the 2014 Australia Group 2 series. Mary presents Developing the Will to Receive God's Love, filmed on the 4th of August 2014 in Monterey, New South Wales, Australia. All right, guys. Um, I want to leave plenty of time for my soulmate because he's got a lovely uh, presentation to give you guys today. So I just want to run through with you in my husky voice <laughs> um, a bit about developing the will to receive God's love. Um, but before I do that, I probably want to talk to you about two gifts and to me, these are the most beautiful gifts I've ever received. And one of these gifts we've all already received. And it's the gift that um, we receive at our incarnation. It helps, uh, well, it creates us to become individuals, free thinking, free feeling, free uh, acting individuals. It's there to help us understand the power of choice that we can create. Ultimately, I believe it's there to help us understand love, the very nature of love, and the power of love and the negative effects of a lack of love. So what is this gift that you all already have? It's a pretty easy question, Peter. Free will. Will, absolutely, yeah. What I want to emphasize to you guys is that that is a gift. And, if you, and I want to ask you the question, how have we already been using this gift? How have we been engaging this will, Anto? Up until probably recently, I've been pretty menacing with it. Menacing? <laughs> oh my goodness. What does that mean? Well, I mean, I got to the point where I couldn't feel at all. I, I used every means to suppress and help others suppress by doing profession and everything. Yep, yep. So what was driving that use of your will, do you feel? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, just a desire not to want to know anything about, to feel the hurt that I really yeah. was feeling. Yep, so in avoidance, would you say, of pain? Yeah. Yep. yep. Fear? A lot of fear. Yeah. Yeah. So who can agree with that? Who can say that in their life they've pretty much been using their will in harmony with fear? Yeah. Jane? Yeah, definitely. I've been living in fear yep. most of my life, I feel. Yeah. Yep. Yep. What, what other attitudes or ways have, what other ways have we felt about this gift of will? Jules? I didn't see it as a gift. Mm -hmm. I saw it as a right. Ah, yeah, yep. So yeah. something I, I should have yeah, and I should I get what I want. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's uh, put down as a right, and I need to put up as in fear. Okay, as a right. Yep. Bruce, what? How about you? Um, a free will to do what I want. Yeah, yeah. You've so, so you sort of felt the same with Jules, sort of entitled. Entitled and, yeah, at the cost of, at the cost of any one or thing. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, Nikki? Um, I guess Nikki. for me it's, it's kind of been opposite. I feel my will's been taken away. Yeah. Like in some cases, rather than I've never felt it's my right or anything, just mm -hmm. like it's taken away at certain times. Yes. So, what's been your feeling towards your will in those cases? Um, I guess that uh, I didn't know how to engage it. Yep. Um, and for me a lot of times i i can relate to that feeling and also i got into a space of wanting other people to 
be responsible for my will then, you know? Like, I, it was a begrudging thing that I had to make a choice. Like, I became so used to feeling like uh, it was a pain to have my will as a child. Then I was like, yeah, I don't even want to face that pain. Now I want other people to kind of be in charge of my will as well. Yeah. So, yeah. So you felt almost a sense of uh, un what's the opposite of entitlement? Like, um, like wavered, like wavered it. No. Yep, wavered it, gave it up, tried yeah. to, yep, yep. And, and I'll add mine, like a begrudging use of my will. So some people have that. And what about this issue, what have we used our will to do? Kel? Be unloving and... So out of harmony with love? Yes. Yep. Yep. That's great, guys. I just wanted to cover with you, like, let's think about how we've been using this will. And this is really common for most people, in fear, out of harmony with love. We've either felt entitled or we don't want it, we tried to give it away. And the one thing that most of us, most of the time, have been trying to do is avoid responsibility for it, haven't we? We've felt entitled to it or that we have to give it up or whatever. But in the end, a lot of us have been trying to avoid the fact that we're responsible for the choices we make and we're responsible for the actions we take, haven't we? And this is a part of avoiding it as a gift. Uh, Kel? Yeah, I just had this, um, ma I'd made a decision that because this harm was done to me as a child, that was it, somebody else had to take it out of me. Yes, yeah. So it's, that's almost an angry use of our yes. will, isn't it? It's yeah. almost punishing, like, yeah. no, I'm going to get what I want and do what I want. Yeah. So what's our other choice? Obviously, I've written all these things up in the board to illustrate like we have different choices, aren't we? Don't we? Instead of using our will out of fear, we can be courageous, can't we? And challenge fear. So with courage. We can begin to view this gift for the gift that it is and understand that with it comes responsibility. Most people want to rebel at that thought, don't they? And often when we talk about issues like forgiveness and repentance, many people want to say, oh, actually, oh, no, I, no, I didn't know any of this stuff. I don't want to be responsible for the actions I took and now dealing with the consequences of those things. Yeah. But if we are going to receive this gift as that very powerful tool that I talked about in the beginning, which is there to help us understand ourselves as individuals, our power to create things, the power of love and things out of harmony with love. We're going to have to receive this gift, aren't we? As a gift, recognise it as a gift. Yep, makes sense. Okay, what other things did I put down here? Yeah, just that many of us are hesitant with our will rather than decisive. Many of us want to give away our will or decry responsibility for it rather than saying, no, this is what I want to do and I'll face the consequences of what, I, of what I'm doing. And ultimately, many of us are trying to give away all of the, the entirety of the gift, really, the package, if you like, that the gift is, and we have the choice to actually receive it and to use it. Does that make sense? Yeah. I wanted to cover that with you because the second greatest gift I've ever received is very linked to the first one that, you've all that we've all received already. And without embracing this first gift of will in a responsible and loving way, I could never receive the second gift. And it's the gift that has the power to change our soul change our life, bring us understanding that we, have ne that we can't even conceive of. It changes the very substance of who we are. And you all know the gift I'm talking about, don't you? The gift of God's love. Yeah. Yeah.
But unless we receive that first gift, unless we embrace it decisively, unless we want that gift of will, we are never ever going to receive the second gift, which is the powerful, beautiful, healing, transforming gift of God's love. Okay. And you know what? I reckon that's the gut of my whole talk. <laughs> There's more things I want to say, but I, I almost want to say, like, that's the most important thing. If you grasp nothing else from what I'm about to say for the next half an hour, just to understand that this first gift, the gift of will, is a gift that we can be responsible for and that we can embrace in harmony with love that we can honour as a gift almost and utilise as the very tool that God has given us to even understand who we are. If we can do that, then we have the possibility of the second gift of God's love, but only then, not before, there's no shortcut, there's no other way around it. And if you think about all of the things that we've been talking to you about throughout this week or a week and a bit together, which I'm going to revise with you really quickly, a lot of that has been about encouraging you to begin to embrace this will that you all already have to love. If you remember the first talk I spoke to you was about embracing the will to love. And the guy spoke to you about the desire to change and the resistance to change. This is like giving you a G up for everything we talked about following that. And do you remember the topics we covered? We covered the self, the facade self and the hurt self. And in order to engage with healing those parts of yourself, you're going to have to embrace this will. It's not going to happen magically. You're going to have to choose to want to go there. And can you see how dealing with those things is really important if we're going to receive God's love? And some of that Cornelius has just covered with you in his talk. I'm just going to use some slides now. <clears throat> Oops. Okay. That's just what I talked to you about now, the gift of will. And actually, this is a little bit of a summary of how we, we currently use our will and how we could choose to engage our will. So most of us would use our will begrudgingly or fearfully when we could be enthusiastic and courageous. Out of harmony with God's love or in harmony with God's love. And that's a lot of what Jesus was talking to the group about before we took the first break, the personal feedback session, wasn't it? It was about honouring love and truth above all other things. We can be dependent and hesitant or independent and decisive. We can disclaim responsibility or take responsibility. And we can reject or refuse the gift or we can love, accept and desire it with all of our hearts. And really that last statement, that's really where we, we're aiming for if we're going to want to receive God's love. Because God doesn't really go for wishy-washy. <laughs> God wants all of our heart, not just a little bit, you know. So when we're praying, God wants us to engage all of our will in that, that desire. That's what longing is. Yeah. Okay. So the second gift which I covered with you, and again, this is all on the internet. So <clears throat> we must engage the first gift in order to receive the second. And you know, I think that is an awesome system. I love that God's already given us the building blocks and all we have to do is to engage that first building block and the whole universe literally opens up for us. Okay. All right. So as I've said there, this week we've already discussed many of the things involved in embracing our will to love and many of the same things apply if we're going to embrace the will to receive God's love. So let's just really quickly run through those. Oh, the very first thing we're going to have to do. Do you remember the very first thing that 
I talked about in embracing the will to love was facing the arrogant belief that we already know how to love. It makes sense then, doesn't it, if we're going to embrace a will to receive God's love, that we might have to face some arrogance so that we already know what God's love is like and we already know all about this process. Now, I don't know if many of you actually fall into that category, but there are, there are folks out there. <laughs> but it is true, as Corny has gone through with you, we do have a lot of misconceptions about God's nature, don't we? A lot of them are based in the facade and addictions. That's what we believe love to be, which is quite addictive, and that then impacts on how we view God. Okay, so I'm going to run through these really quick, reminding you you can take a look at them later. So we're just going to have to be willing to give up our investments and preconceived ideas and engage the experiment with God. But in order to do that effectively, we are going to have to deal with many of the things that we've already presented to you guys this week. So looking at the facade self, that deconstruction process, can anyone tell me why that is so important if you're going to receive God's love? I mean, some of it, Corny's already covered, Jules. The facade self is only to do with what we present to the world. It's got no truth to it. It's arrogant. It's nasty. It's um, vicious. You know, it's got no love. It's all self-obsessed. Yes. So how can we then extend love if we're so... Um, invested in ourselves. And if we're thinking about receiving God's love, yeah. how, how does that impact on our inability to receive God's love? All those things you just said about the facade. Mm. That actually, it makes us ahead. soft. Oh, sorry. Go Can ahead. I take over your <laughs> That's all right. It just softens us. And, we, and to receive God's love, like the, the facade self is, is hard. It's hard. Yeah. Well, you said very important things about it. It's not very nice. So it's already out of harmony with God's love and truth, isn't it? And we know that we're going to have to bring our will into harmony more with God's love and truth if we're going to receive God's love. And it's not real, just like you said. And God really only deals with real things. So we're going to have to deconstruct it if we actually want to connect with God, just like Corny's uh, um, strip tease he did there at the end. <laughs> okay. So it can't have a relationship with God. And we, like, we've tried and failed, haven't we, most of us, at doing this? All right. And we spoke to you a lot about how to deconstruct the facade, and this is the main reason why we did that. All right. The next thing we talked about was challenging and releasing addictions, wasn't it? Why is that so important when it comes to receiving God's love? Any ideas? Bruce? Um, well, addictions are not in harmony with God's love. Yeah. <laughs> Straight up. So. Straight up. They're not. And in fact, there are attempts to seek to find a quick fix, aren't they, for the lack of love feelings we might feel or the fearful feelings. So they actually take us further away from truth every time, don't they? Yep. And we, we almost want this pseudo-love to fill the gaps. And often we end up calling it love, like we talked about in all the talks about codependence and in our relationships, we end up feeling these addictive barter systems are love and in fact they're not. So, so exactly right. They take us away from God's truth and God's love and we, the most damaging thing is often we end up calling that truth and love. Yeah. So we want the substitution for our unhappy feelings. And this next statement is really relevant. Remember we've talked about this theme of how we use our time many, many times throughout our time together. If we spend more time attempting to have our addictions met, where's the time left over for God and longing for God's love? We're going further away from God's truth and we're spending all our time doing it. So we're going to have to have this reallocation of the way we use our time. Yeah, looking for love in all the wrong places. That's my favourite way of describing addictions. <laughs> it's not really love. Yeah. Okay. And we're never going to look for God's love while we're calling addictive things love. Okay. 
and we spoke about how to challenge and release them during the week. Next thing is experiencing our hurt self. And Cornelius has just gone through with you really why it's so important to experience our hurt self, hey? The fact that these hurt feelings contain a lot of our lack of faith. Remember we talked about uh, in the early parts of the week, the things that block us to change is this deep sense of a lack of faith. And when we connect to our hurt self, now we have the chance to start to connect to those deep-seated feelings of a lack of faith and l release them. And as we release them, not only does our um, openness to God grow, but we get closer to the real self. Okay. So they're often hopeless and disillusioned with God. And it makes sense, doesn't it? How are we ever going to receive God's love unless we start to release our disillusionment with God? This is very um, counterculture, I suppose. We're sort of told that we should believe all these wonderful things about God and skip over all the disillusioned feelings that we have. This never worked for me. I can't connect to God while I still have those feelings within me and I'm trying to deny them. In fact, it's only the facade that tries to deny those feelings. The hurt self really has them there and wants to experience them. And it's only through experiencing them that then we, we make space for the real truth to enter us. Anto? Growing up in a Catholic religion, you go to church, the, the Croatian church, they're all singing and dancing. <laughs> um, how, how do you develop that blind faith in that way? Like, how, how does it occur that... Um, if, you mean, you're, if, if you're disillusioned about God, that you'd have so much supposed faith that you do believe in God and, and, every, and the love that's available. So you mean it, what you observed in that church? Do you think that's really faith that they are experiencing? I'm just curious how you, you get to that. Like, I know I went along with what my parents wanted me to do, but in some way I felt like there was a God to a degree. Um, yeah. And that gave me some faith and it gave me, um, but I, I did have a lot more disillusionment and feelings about God. Yep. I was just seeing a hand up over here, so I'll let Jesus deal with your question. Yeah, I, I feel that a lot of people that go to church don't have a blind faith in God because they actually have received some of God's love. And as Corny said in his talk about developing faith, once you've gone through an experience with God of receiving some of God's love, once you've done that, basically, you've got some faith in God. And it doesn't really matter what the church believes or what they say about God or anything. You don't even half the time believe that either once you've received some of God's love. So I feel a lot of people in Christian churches have received God's love and therefore have some, what I would classify as true faith, where it gets distorted is that they get taught a lot of false things about God that, of course, they can't believe and therefore can't have faith in. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I feel a lot, mo most people who have involved, been involved in religion have had, a, had, had some experience generally where God has touched their heart and once their heart's touched, that's it, basically. From then on, they'll have some faith. Mm. I guess it depends a lot on the parents' openness as well to God, whether their faith is built on a real experience or it's a facade-based faith. But I don't understand the term blind faith. Uh, what do you mean by blind faith? You mean just an uninformed in the way that you feel informed now? Or? I don't necessarily feel I'm informed. But, yep. um, yeah, I was always... I wasn't sure myself about um, whether... The meaning of faith and how, how it actually worked. And yeah. I was, I guess. I, sp I suppose I feel faith, real faith, if there's only one faith that's real, and that is very informed about love um, and God's nature. And so I don't, I, I wasn't trying to be funny, I was just meaning, like, what is blind faith? I don't really get that faith. I was meaning more from the point of view that. Um, that once you've got it, you've just got it. It's like a, it's a hundred percent faith. It's not something that you would grow in, that you in grow. different degrees. Yeah. Um, that it was just, yeah, it was a given then. Mm. So I guess it was my definition that was different. Yep. And you felt that at that time, Anto? Well, 
Well, I'm not certain because the first time I met you guys in Melbourne, um, AJ, surprisingly, he said to us, oh, you, you guys have received God's love. And then I was wondering, like, how is that possible? Yeah. Um, whether that's come from attending, in being part of the religion. Mm. It sounds like it, yeah. yeah. Sounds like it, yeah. Do you, do you want to add something, baby? Yeah, yeah I feel, um, firstly, there's the question of blind faith. I think there is a statement where people, uh, there is a sort of a concept in the world today that you can almost ignore the truth and, and imagine things and that then gives you faith. And that's certainly not the case. That's not real faith. That's just your imagination at work. It's like, it's like there's a lot of people in the planet that believe that God's a punishing God. Mm -hmm. And they have complete what they classify as faith in that. But the reality is it's not faith because they have never experienced that. So, exactly, so yeah. it's actually just an idea or a concept that they have dog, doggedly and dogmatically held on to about God. But yeah, in the case of Anto and Jane, because they've went, gone along to church when they were little and they were open to receiving some of God's love, they received some. And, uh, and the church, a lot of churches are a great environment to receive some of God's love as long as you don't listen to all the dogma and <laughs> the false teachings about God and God's nature. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Thanks. No worries. Uh, Catherine? Can I just say what I was taught about blind faith was the fact that if you didn't understand, such as I, I wanted to know why I had to go to confession. Yeah. Because if God died for, if Jesus died for our sins, why then did we have to confess them? Yes. <laughs> and I was told, <laughs> I was told that, all right, you don't understand it but you've got to have faith and believe it. Yeah. And this is why I said I don't feel, I feel it's an oxymoron to have blind faith because that becomes a faith, a faith that's based in facade because it's not anything to do with your heart, is it? You're just doing it because you, oh, I've got to do it. No, yeah. we were told to do it, yes. yes. And if we couldn't have believe it, well, we just have to have faith that this is the way God made it. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty sad, eh? Yeah. All right. Anything else on, on that? No? Okay. So we're talking about the hurt self and, and experiencing these, really these feelings in opposition to faith, if you like. Hopelessness. <clears throat> and all of these things, as you know, if you feel about them, they prevent you sincerely longing to God. And many of us still have feelings of these lack of faith suppressed within us. And we talked about how to emotionally connect to the hurt self during the week, and this is a lot of the reason why. Because doing these things is actually going to open you up to receiving God's love as long as you exercise your will in that direction. Jules, you're reading. Yep. Okay, and the final topic that we talked about was engaging forgiveness and repentance. Now, why do you think forgiveness and repentance are essential to receiving God's love, if we're growing this will to receive God's love? Kel? Uh, because they engage us to remove all our damage to be able to be closer to God. They do, but if you think about it, you could do that whole process we just talked about, about the facade and the addictions and the hurt self, and never actually engage forgiveness and repentance. Mm. So why do you think it's important, Justin? Because if we're not doing both of those things, then we're closed to love. And if we're closed to love, then we can't receive it from God. Yeah, I suppose essentially that's correct, yep, yeah. yes, definitely. These things open us to love. Can you be more specific about the love? If we go to Nikki. Uh, is it because people on the natural love path they can still deconstruct the facade and stuff like that, whereas 
repentance and forgiveness, that's a divine law. It is. So one whereby, you know, it's the highest law, one of the highest laws of the universe, whereby if you engage in that, then, you, you know, you don't have to waste your time kind of doing all of these other things. You can basically <laughs> cut, cut, cut the process a lot shorter. Yeah, it is kind of a fast track. Yeah. There's two probably things I'd like to say about it. Jesus, you want to say something? No, Lani? Because if we're um, asking for God's forgiveness and we can't ask for God's forgiveness if we haven't forgiven our human brothers and sisters. Yes, yes, yes. It's about how this, how God's laws and our will used out of harmony with love, how that breaks God's laws or it is in opposition to God's laws and how if we can't forgive and desire to love God's children, our brothers and sisters, how, and Jesus talked about this last night, if you remember, how, how is this, how are we going to ask for forgiveness from God and how are we going to really sincerely ask for love when we don't want to uphold love around us? Does that make sense? My PowerPoint makes much more sense than I do. <laughs> okay, it deals with areas in my life where I've been in opposition to God because I'm breaking God's laws. Every time I've used my will out of harmony with love to harm another person or to harm myself or to refuse forgiveness, I've been out of harmony with God's laws. I've been ignoring the love of my brothers and sisters. So dealing with these issues places me more in harmony with God's love. As Nikki mentioned, we're, we're trying to engage with God in the most direct way, really. We're going for the direct route here. So it opens me up to a relationship with God. And if you remember some of the things Jesus spoke about last night, he talked about this almost being the basis of our relationship with God. And if you think about all of the issues that you have in your life, in terms of error, they all involve an issue of forgiveness or repentance, don't they? Yeah. Jules? Mary, was I right in thinking that when I'm engaging in repentance and forgiveness, I'm also asking God for his forgiveness? Yes. As well? Yes. And I'm also asking God to help me um, repent. Yes. Is, is that right? Yes. So I, w so I also need God's forgiveness for what I've done. When you're in the process of repentance, yes. When I'm in, in yes, towards my brothers and sisters. Yes. That's right? Yes. yes. Okay. When you engage the process of repentance, that's, yes. you want to involve God and you want to feel God's forgiveness. That's what I mean. So yes. I've got, I'm actually asking for God's forgiveness Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and so that's the mechanics of repentance. But I'm talking about why that is so essential if we're going to receive God's love. Now, obviously, when you receive God's forgiveness, you're receiving God's love as well. Yeah. Yeah. But if you think about it, even just in sort of scientific terms, how are we going to ask for God's love if we're blocked to these issues where we're ignoring love of our brothers and sisters? We can't. Not with sincerity. Yeah. 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 Cool. It ain't going to happen. No. <laughs> cool. All right, guys. So that's really just a bit of revision of what we've covered this week and to tell you why it's so relevant. to engage. We're going to have to engage our will to do all of these things if we're going to develop the will to receive God's love and to strengthen that will. There are four other aspects, things that we that we should do, okay, that's an important question. Um, so you, the, I've given, we've given you all these how-tos during the week, how to do this, how to, how to deconstruct your facade, how to deal with your addictions, how to, you know, how to get into a space where you're open to receiving God's love. The biggest question, which is the question that involves your will, the very first gift, is do you actually want to do it? Because unless you want to do it, unless you want to receive God's love, anything else you do 
it's, it's not going to have any impact. And so this is where we can again begin to think about our will like a muscle. Do you remember I did that at the start of the week? So while we're using our will and engaging our will to um, engage with the facade and the addictions and the hurt self and forgiveness and repentance, there's also this issue of just strengthening that will muscle to receive God's love. And what were four key things I said, and I used the analogy of weight, weight training, what were the four things? Does anyone know the four things that I said we needed to in order to grow a muscle? Peter, oh, Bruce, we'll go to Bruce and then we'll go to Peter. Bruce is looking a bit like, oh, I can't remember them all. Four things may be hard, but uh, <laughs> um, exercise it or stimulate it. Yes, we talked about overloading stimulus, didn't yeah. we? Which we Overload, drew. Overwhelm. Overwhelming, yes. Yep. Repeat. Repeat, 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 yes. Repetition. Yep. Gee, now, nourish. Nourish, very good. Yep. And uh, cleanse or truth. Waters of truth, Waters that's of right, truth. yes. Excellent, thank you. So... We used that analogy for growing the will to love muscle, didn't we? Really quickly, I'm going to ask you what you guys have as, an, as ideas for how are we going to, developing this will to receive God's love, engage with overwhelming stimuli, because we know that's going to grow the muscle. Repetition. How are we going to nourish this will to receive God's love? And how are we going to seek truth in that endeavour to support the growth of that muscle to receive God's love? So what do you guys think about overwhelming stimuli? Just a few things that you would do in engaging the will to receive God's love. Jane? Um, challenge my addictions, I feel. Start challenging myself. Yeah. Okay. So that's a lot of what we talked about previously, like challenging your addictions. How is that going to help you receiving God's love, though? Because the more I start challenging my addictions, so if I get angry, so more emotions going to come up and I'm going yep. to become overwhelmed emotionally. You are. <laughs> That's going to help you with, with, with the process of deconstruction, I suppose, of addictions and facades. But what about if we're talking specifically about this will muscle to receive God's love? Yep. Jules? Um, to be truthful, God's truth at all times, um, no matter what the situation is. That's going to help you with developing your will to love. Absolutely. That'll be overwhelming emotionally. Yes. So let's talk about the will to receive God's yes. love. And let me give you, uh, if we come forward to Lani... Yeah. I'm sorry, everyone, my voice is really giving out. Yeah. Prayer? Prayer, yes. Yes. And we're going to engage with this relationship with God, aren't we, through, we call it prayer or longing, and we're going to allow that engagement with God to overwhelm us emotionally. If we don't do that, we're not, we're not engaging with this enough stimulus. It's like, oh, God... No, okay, that's enough. That's not overwhelming us, is it? If we, if we draw back immediately. And so we're not going to be overwhelmed in that process, yeah? It's like in the um, Solomon, the pageant messages that you and Jesus did. Yeah. You're talking about, you know, the prayer, keep repeating, keep repeating. Yes, well, and that brings us to the repetition part of it, doesn't it? So if we talk about a little bit more about the overwhelming stimuli, we're going to engage with God and allow that connection to overwhelm us. Makes sense, doesn't it? Another really um, key thing that we can do is, in this process of deconstructing all of our stuff, is to keep trusting and honouring that God is placing in front of us the very next thing that we need to deal with if we're going to connect with him. 
that's going to be good for us. A lot of us come up to things, we go, oh, that's too overwhelming. I'm going to deal with this side issue of like chocolate addiction rather than this huge whopping issue in my relationship. You know, I've been dealing with a lot of, what did you say to me earlier in the week, Kel? Shopping, I don't do that as much. I don't do coffee, I don't do this, but there's all this stuff in my relationship that's banging us in the head every single day. But we go, oh, look, no, too overwhelming, not going to do it. But if we, want to, if we want to receive God's love, we're going to use our will to go, I'm trusting God in this. God knows what's the next best thing for me to deal with. And that will be overwhelming. Repetition. So if we're not praying every single day, how much will do we really have and how much are we growing our will? And a lot of us avoid the engagement with prayer because we feel hopeless about it, don't we? But imagine if you engaged your will to pray every day and it uncovered a huge feeling of hopelessness that you grieved. Now, wouldn't that be better? That would be overwhelming. (laughs) And that would help your will muscle, the will to receive God's love, to grow. Justin, you want to ask something? Oh, you're scratching. Yep, cool. All right. Nourishing. What do you think is going to nourish this will to receive God's love? What might we engage with? Jesus? Um, Just knowing more about God. So trying, spending a lot of our time studying about God, thinking about God, looking at the universe and investigating how, what the universe teaches us about God, um, giving every single interaction we have with other people, what does it tell us about God? Yep. Um, every interaction we have with the environment, what does that tell us about God? And so forth, yep. just, just, yep. just drawing every question back, what does this show me about God? About God. So you, and lots of things that Corny alluded to as well, of just being in nature and allowing all that stuff about God and engaging, as you said, the will, like, right, now I'm in this interaction, what's it going to show me about God? Right, well, now I'm going to have another interaction, seeking out those opportunities. Mm -hmm. Justin? I find myself doing that and it drives me absolutely mad at times. (laughs) Like, it it really does because every, I I walk around going, okay, what's this about? What's that about? And it's just, and I get in this analytical like analytic kind of analytic. space <laughs> and it just drives me crazy. Yeah. Like, yeah. Why does it drive you crazy? Because there's just so much going on in my head. Yeah, and it's not going and it's on not, in your heart. Yeah. Yeah, and I just have to eventually I just have to go I just just one thing, just just one, just forget the rest, it'll come back to me later. Yeah. Just I just need to just block it all out and just <laughs> go for one. Well, if you focus on one and getting it from your head to your feeling state, that's great. Because yeah, it is overwhelming. <clears throat> right. <laughs> and so can you see, and this is something that I was trying to help the group with during the week, is like when so much comes at us and we resist, then we go, oh, I've had enough, I can't do it. But if we allow the overwhelm, we end up connecting to our feeling state. Like, there, I can't tell you how many times I've done that in living with Jesus. Like, oh my gosh, it's so much now. You've just told me, I really just need to cry about how much that is, you know. And if I didn't have that cry, I wouldn't be open to engaging with the rest of it. So it's a good point you raise. But just let yourself feel the, feel the overwhelm rather than like <laughs> intellectually trying to manage the overwhelm. Yeah, actually, that's a, that's a really good way of putting it too. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Now, what about our exposure to truth when it comes to growing this will to receive God's love? How is that going to apply, do you reckon? Nikki? Is it to do with the law of attraction? So just to keep a, like... uh, or you focus just on everything coming to you. Um, Because I guess if the law of attraction is God's messenger of truth, then I guess you've just got to, like, always be sensitive to all your interactions with everyone, I guess. It's sort of similar to what Justin was saying, wasn't it? Like, analysing, okay, what truth is being shown to me through this attraction or whatever? 
yeah, I feel that's a huge part of it. But keeping in mind it's the honour of God's truth that we want to see. So remember, I encouraged a few people during the week to analyse what is God's truth in relation to what I feel. And so I feel that's a big part of it also. Yeah, thanks, Nikki. Yeah, Kelly? Yeah, it was up, like uphold truth in mm-hmm. all situations and see and don't ignore the truth when you can see it. Yeah, and being humble to the truth that God's trying to show us, hey. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. A lot of us get into this, like, I'm going to uphold truth when it's just our personal truth as well. And so it's important to draw that distinction, honey. Yep. We, we have a tendency to uphold the truth only when we've got personal investment. Exactly. And then when there's no personal investment, we have a tendency to completely ignore the truth in a lot of cases. And we gave a lot of examples this week where people even in the kitchen, you know, when we were having dinner, we were having discussions after dinner where people just completely overlook the truth in that moment um, because there's no personal thing you're going to get out of it. You might get attacked, actually. Yes. <laughs> and, and this is about having the courage to actually live in harmony with the truth about God and God's principles that you receive in the process. So, yeah. Yeah, regardless of our personal how it might affect our personal circumstances. Mm. Just that very, that one thing alone, adhering to that one thing alone, has the power to bring you through so much stuff, like fear of emotional overwhelm. Trust me, you're going to face that one when you just decide, that's it, I'm upholding God's truth and God's principles in every interaction today. It doesn't matter what's going to happen to me. It doesn't matter how I might be perceived. It doesn't matter what I might lose my job, I might lose my relationship. You know, by 4 p.m., my whole life could be changed. And trust me, that's a good way to progress really rapidly and get through your fear of change. You're dealing with your resistance to truth. You know, a lot of lack of faith feelings can come up by midday. (laughs) Okay. Okay. So here's a bit of a summary of things we've just discussed. I'll just let you look at that for a bit, rest my voice a tiny bit. All right. And remember in the discussion that I had with Cornelius, uh, when Cornelius was doing the weights lifting, we talked about things to avoid. Can anyone remember some of the things we talked about to avoid? when trying to grow this will. Uh, Bruce? Um, Getting someone to do it for you. Yes, (laughs) getting someone to do it for you. How's that gonna work out with uh, longing for God's love? It's not really gonna work out that good, is it? (laughs) It's impossible, in fact. And one of the big things we talked about was, and I'll just pop them up on the screen because I think it's the next slide, yep. Relying on others. So imagine if we just start relying on others to g us up in this pursuit of God. Yeah, God, I, you know, that's who's experienced that really encouraging support for you seeking God. Not many, most of the time, because most of the world's in a lot of resistance, they're resisting that process, and so you're going to have to avoid relying on others for validation in that quest. Bruce, Um, I think I've relied on you two guys. (laughs) <laughs> a lot. Yeah, yeah, that's common. That's something we're working through a bit as well, you know, helping everyone to embrace this gift of will, that it's your gift of will and there's only so much we can do. Yeah. And giving up when things get uncomfortable. This is so common in our Western society. You just give up and try something different whenever things get a bit challenging. But given that in this quest to receive God's love, we're going to have to deconstruct a lot of things that feel a bit uncomfortable, like our facade and our addictions and experiencing pain and emotional overwhelm in our hurt self. We're not going to get very far if we give up at the first sign of discomfort. And this is where this adherence to principles of truth and love will really pull us through a lot as well. Does that make sense to everyone? Lani? And we've been so conditioned to seek comfort and, you know, make our lives really, you know, smooth and... Yes. So, yeah, there is a a resistance to feeling all that 
huge changes and yeah and look guys you know <clears throat> when jesus uh, read out the list of names today i almost felt like i didn't really deserve to be on that list honestly <laughs> Because this growing my will to receive God's love again is really challenging for me also. Um, I feel like I've been conditioned to seek a lot of what I have called comfort. But as I've worked through this process of um, deconstructing my facade and dealing with my addictions, that's felt really, really uncomfortable. For five years, it's felt really, really uncomfortable. So I did have to keep growing this, you know, desire for truth and you know coming back to truth and it's maybe a stubborn aspect of our soul when it's in error i can't let things lie if i know that there's an error involved so i you know i came back a lot of times to things that were very uncomfortable for me and i had to be willing to go through that and do you know what i'm finding now at the end of five years this process that I'm talking to you guys, I spoke twice this week about will because I am so passionate about it at the moment because I've been someone who didn't want to know about their will. And now that I'm like rediscovering, if you like, this gift of my will, it's so precious to me. And it's, it, it's a wonderful thing actually to embrace your will. It feels uncomfortable as we go through all that deconstruction process. But as you start to make headway in there, in roads, it's, it feels like a beautiful thing. And what I used to call comfort now feels gross and disgusting and like really uncomfortable to me. Like sitting and having an, a dinner chat that's totally in facade and addictions now feels oh, I don't know if I can bear it, you know. If there's not any bit of truth in the next two minutes, I've got to go, you know. <laughs> and if I don't have a voice, well, we're stuffed. If no one else wants it, I'm going to have to leave. Um, do you know, and there's a new kind of what I would call um, joy or satisfaction or Comfort, maybe even if you call it, except you probably wouldn't call it comfort if you're still on the other side of addictions and facade because it feels much more real. It's much more exposed. The truth is more present in every interaction. And I'm not perfect at that yet, but even just growing my will enough to want those things again, that feels precious and it does feel like a gift that I'm actually receiving this gift uh, again properly. So it's getting used to feeling exposed. Yeah, that's one of the many things. <laughs> Uncomfortable, you know, exposed. That was a big thing for me. I wanted, I, there's a lot of fear of judgment and condescension in me. So um, I felt very, I feel often still really exposed when someone points out an error or something. Um, but when you love truth, when you grow this love of truth and this will to love, you get used to that feeling and you feel it more as your own feeling rather than projecting it out as a discomfort onto others. So it's going from fear of being exposed to love of being exposed. Yeah, yeah. Because you know exposure is the real thing. Like it's all, if we're, if we're looking at things from God's perspective, there is no, you know, all that chatter chatter facade stuff we put up it doesn't even exist god's like looking at the the real stuff going what are they doing it's all a big smoke and mirrors attempt and none of it's real yeah 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 okay guys so i think that's about it and i did it in time i apologize deeply for my voice it's very <laughs> might be a little bit hard to follow Oh, actually, I'm not finished. <laughs> Two other things that we said to avoid. Eating junk food, remember? And the sugary, what feels all wonderful and smooth and sweet out there in the world, all the lies that have, the, you know, I always think of the Coke commercial where everyone's smiling and fit, drinking down the poisonous sugar, you know. <laughs> That's kind of what it's like in the world out there, isn't it? And we can buy into that, can't we? Because everyone goes, hey, you're one of the team and this is great. And even if in deep inside you feel like this is all a big lie, there's an attraction there, isn't there? But if we're going to receive God's love, develop this will to receive God's love, we're going to say no to that in future. I think that, so engaging in junk activities, this is like 
the junk activities we've referred to a lot, like, you know, oh, there's so much junk you can engage in, isn't there? Like computer games and, you know, fashion magazines and all these things that really don't hold any spiritual value. All these things that just sort of ways that we've addictively created to pass the time. And for lots of us, that's seemingly really in like banal things that you wouldn't really call sinful, even cooking. I've engaged cooking as a junk food activity just to pass the time and distract myself at times, you know. So we're going to, if we really want to grow this will to receive God's love, we're going to stop engaging in those activities. And then drinking down the lies and letting ourselves get away with it just for the sake of fitting in or avoiding a bit of discomfort or uncomfortability. <clears throat> okay. All right, I want to finish now, guys, because Jesus has wonderful things to say to you. Not that I'm building him up. <laughs> um, in conclusion, I want to bring you back to those two greatest gifts. If we don't embrace the first, we will never receive the second. So growing this will to love, the first talk I gave to you during the week, that is so essential if we're going to receive God's love. So they're not the same thing, but one supports the next. Okay. So a bit of revision. To strengthen our will to receive God's love, we must face the arrogant belief that we already know everything about God. Deconstruct the facade, challenge the addictions, and connect to the hurt self. Engaging forgiveness and repentance. And then the overwhelm, prayer, truth. <clears throat> and these things to avoid the relying on others, giving up, wasting time with junk activities and drinking down lies about God and self. For any, if you think about however long you've been engaged with divine truth, the things that are slowing you down come from this list. If you really think about it, you can see that, can't you? And of course, resistance to the first three things we talked about during the week, the emotional overwhelm, the feelings of a lack of faith and truth. Okay, there's a little bit of homework. How do I use the following three things in a manner that strengthens and develops within me my soul-based sincere desire to have a relationship with God. So your time, your will, and your desire to be in truth. And if you think about it, that's the three things that Jesus introduced to you as ways to analyse your change or your desire for change at the start of the week. So I'll leave that with you guys. And, oh, yeah, I just really want to encourage you towards those two gifts. Remember in the beginning I said, that's really the, the treasure for me is recognising this first gift of will. That's the thing that leads me to the possibility of the second gift. So I'll leave that with you and we'll have a couple of minutes break and then Jesus will come and speak to you about prayer.